Um, it's my privilege, uh, absolutely, to be delivering this uh, memorial lecture for M. N. Vijayan. Um, I'm so honored that you asked me to do this. And uh, I know that we are not able to meet in person, but uh, uh, these are the online forums nowadays, which uh, we do have to um, replace these, you know, uh, instead of uh, in-person meetings because of the uh, pandemic situation. But uh, I think that uh, it's also brilliant that we are able to meet in these times and we are able to exchange our ideas in these times. And uh, I also am so happy with uh, the topic that you have chosen because uh, it is exactly, I think, what we need to discuss. And uh, as I was preparing to speak to you today, I thought about what are the aspects of this new normal. In a sense, there are two kinds of new normal in front of us. One is, of course, that for the past two years, there has been this uh, pandemic situation globally. And so many of the things, including the fact that we are doing this meeting virtually, there are many things that the pandemic has changed and perhaps changed forever. And I think we are still taking stock of those things. But um, largely, those are not the things which I will be touching upon today. I think what I wanted to look at was what the past uh, eight years or so under the Modi regime, how has that changed the world as we know it, India as we know it? And what is it that we can and must do in these circumstances? It, especially what are the things that we need to change in terms of fighting back in these circumstances? What are the new realities that we have to take into account? And what will be our response to these new realities? Um, because, so I was thinking about the world uh, seven or eight years before and many things that we perhaps took, took for granted. Uh, and we can uh, see how major pieces of the jigsaw puzzle of the world around us are completely changed. In a way, they are put back together in a new way, uh, which perhaps still maybe before eight years had somebody told us that these would be the pieces in place, it may have seemed almost unbelievable because these are very major changes. And I think of them, of these changes as um, infrastructural changes, which the Modi regime and uh, its allied BJP governments in various states have done and are doing um, to keep in keeping in view a future Hindu Rashtra, a future Hindu nation. And they have that goal very firmly in place. And keeping that goal in mind, they are making legal changes, they are changing the social climate, they are changing the modes of governance, they are changing the way in which we understand elections and democracy, democratic uh, participation, and they are uh, changing the rules which used to be in place in a very, very big way. And uh, let's think about what are the big changes that we have uh, undergone and uh, which in a sense are almost uh, you know, accepted now as a new normal. For instance, think about uh, Kashmir post the uh, abrogation of Article 370. Kashmir is almost a uh, black hole in uh, consciousness in India, political consciousness in India now. It's a taboo subject. Uh, almost no one would, uh, you know, among, in mainstream politics, it is accepted as a gone issue. And uh, in a sense, uh, in the visual imagination, in, in our imagination about uh, political imagination, uh, Kashmir is almost off the map now. And speaking about Kashmir and speaking about what has been done to Kashmir, that has become something uh, extremely fraught with danger. We know, we know that. The other big change, of course, is 
what is the way in which UAPA has been used to silence many of the voices which we took for granted around us. We took for granted that around us, we would have Sudha Bharadwaj, we would have Gautam Nolakha, we would have Anand Til Tumde. We would have so many of these comrades, as well as this whole young new crop of <coughs> activists, Umar Khaled and so many others, right? So uh, the fact that those voices are in prison, many others are not yet in prison, but are certainly in the sights of this government. And so there is a strategic uh, you know, silencing or whatever it is that you can say. That is uh, something which is again around us. Uh, it has been around us for a long time and uh, is part of this new normal that we are seeing now. Then if you look at the legal changes that have been made, I think that the whole uh, Citizenship Amendment Act, uh, NRC, NPR, that infrastructure has been passed. It has not yet been accepted as the new normal because of a remarkable uh, public uh, movement against it. Uh, it is not yet, um, you know, the rules for those laws are not yet promulgated. Perhaps with the new census uh, that is to start very soon, maybe this year there will be an attempt to implement NPR, we do not know. But yes, we can say that uh, there's an attempt in that direction which didn't maybe go as far as the government would have liked it to go. But there are other laws, for instance, in various states, there are these anti-conversion laws which are being passed, which are essentially, uh, you know, in common parlance, they are being described as uh, so-called anti love jihad laws and all of that. And essentially what they are is that they are a part of the, uh, again, they know that uh, perhaps uh, high courts or even Supreme Court may strike down these laws or, uh, you know, uh, change them quite a lot because they attempt to violate basic uh, privacies, basic right to decide what one's own religion is, who one will marry, etc. cetera. Um, but these laws are being passed and in a sense, they're an attempt to change our accepted common sense around uh, these issues, I think. Um, along with that, you also have, of course, another very major legal change, which is by now, uh, which has been in place now for a long time, uh, again, enacted in a very uh, dubious way, but uh, it is very much in place and it has changed the elections as we know them, electoral bonds. So election funding as we know it has been probably irrevocably changed and uh, <clears throat> electoral bonds has essentially uh, put in place a system which is um, hiding in plain sight. So you have it, um, uh, the corporate, a big corporate, maybe even foreign funding for political parties, primarily the BJP, because we know that the lion's share of the electoral bonds uh, goes to the BJP. That is coming in. And what is the quid pro quo for that? What is being done in return by uh, the ruling BJP for various corporations, various entities? That is something we do not know. But that is something which is very much in place. What that money is being used for? Is it being used only for elections? Is it being used for other purposes? There is no way of knowing because there is no accounting or accountability for those funds. It's absolutely, it's a uh, black hole over there. And uh, again, it has uh, maybe irrevocably uh, rendered opposition parties um, much, much weaker than the BJP, than the ruling party. Simply in terms of, if you just see in terms of liquid money in hand, because uh, uh, there is simply no comparison. The playing field is so skewed over there that uh, there is, uh, I, I think that for parties that contest elections, um, the old situation, the old uh, normal, that is a very, very far cry right now. Um, another thing which I think we are gradually realizing is part of this new normal very much is the fact of surveillance. I think the mass surveillance, mass collection of data, uh, the use of Aadhaar and now uh, 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 these are things, Aadhaar is something which is uh, being used, being used in ways which we are unaware of probably 
we may, many of the ways we may not yet even be aware of how uh, surveillance and data is being used and uh, tapped into but we do know by now that at least one of the ways in which uh, illegal surveillance is happening especially on citizens whom the government uh, thinks of as being activists or uh, people organizing uh, movements and so on uh, dissidents of any kind even inside the ruling party someone whom amit shah is not completely 100% sure of perhaps uh, they are being surveilled by the use of israeli software pegasus we don't know who is funding that we don't know where the money for that is coming from uh, without any legal new legal infrastructure in place uh, this form of surveillance uh, state surveillance possibly even earlier was a reality but now uh, it has been uh, upgraded to a degree which probably would have been unimaginable some years ago that is again something uh, you know that surveillance is right here on our phones right here in our computers right here inside our lives with all these things and there is another uh, thing which i think uh, uh, you know the the lynchings lynch mob uh, violence which has become uh, so common which has become you know the first few lynchings that happened there was a, a tremendous shock around them uh, angry mobilization around them and by now it is this horrible bloody kind of new normal where uh, communal lynchings islamophobic lynchings these have become far far more common and the question of justice in these the question of uh, finding uh, you know uh, fighting back against this has become far more challenging islamophobia itself i think uh, the degree to which it has seeped in like a slow poison Uh, or even like a fast poison and the way it has changed uh, the gaze of people around us not that it was not there earlier but i think the kind of <coughs> uh, acceptability and respectability it has gotten uh, the degree to which it feels unashamed in being out in public in uh, completely stripped of any disguise uh, islamophobic hate speech in politic in political discourse and uh, you know now openly calls for genocide this is happening now it is not yet perhaps entirely normal uh, you know auctioning muslim women online or calling for the genocide of the entire muslim community but these are being there is an attempt to turn it into a new normal and it's certainly happening around us what is clearly uh, another aspect of this is that those who call for genocide and obviously you know there are people who are organizing uh, these so called dharm sansads uh, hate hate assemblies all over in the name of hindu religion and they are being addressed by so called leaders of hindu religion and these are basically platforms calling for hindus to arm themselves arm their children and arm themselves in order to achieve a hindu nation by wiping out the muslim minority and there are explicit references to myanmar and uh, the genocide of rohingya people there uh, there are explicit calls to achieve the same inside india and yet these are uh, the organizers of these here uh, hate assemblies uh, they are not being seen as conspirators uh, to overthrow the uh, country as we know it overthrow the constitution as we know it they are not being they are not being arrested they are not being hmm, Uh, booked under uh, uh, laws relevant for such a conspiracy instead uh, the laws which are uh, you know which we were told were for such conspiracies are now you know but we knew otherwise they are now being quite openly used uh, in order to punish those who organize for peace organize for justice and organizing for peace for justice for uh, any kind of people's movement that is being equated with conspiracy and all of that and you know the i think the we are all familiar by now maybe with this experience of this almost unreal kind of feeling where you are trying to find out how to convey to people that uh, this outrageous thing is happening and to you know to to try and make make others see how outrageous this contrast is right make others see how outrageous it is that uh, such open conspiracy that such calls for 
call that the such hate assemblies are in fact calling for genocide that there is in fact a conspiracy there that there is in fact a conspiracy that is overthrowing our constitutional nation as we know it and uh, that that is going completely unpunished that the big media is completely ignoring that that's another part of our new normal absolutely the acceptance that big media is a propaganda machine for the government and uh, not just for the government for the sang parivar and for islamophobia essentially that is uh, state sponsored media even though it is private media even though it is corporate media but largely there is you know the the notion of press freedom is almost out of the window even when it comes to print even when it comes to uh, respectable um, you know journalist journalism of courage and so on uh, basically the carrying of adver islamophobic advertisements implying that it is muslims who are rioters these are uh, you know these are half page full page ads that are going to appear in those very in the pages of those very papers so i think uh, you know we know that these are the contours of the situation that we face to face but what can be the way in which uh, we acknowledge this situation but we fight back and what are the ways in which our fighting back would be different necessarily different from the ways in which we would be fighting back maybe 8 uh, years ago, before the past 8 uh, 8 years or so what are the different things that we would change oh yes there's another very important aspect which uh, i should mention which is that we are approaching the 75 years of india's freedom and the manner in which right now there is an attempt to change the common sense idea about what is freedom that is also something that is happening uh, which we must be aware of we must uh, we must recognize that uh, just to give you an example just the other day um, the uh official press information bureau handle twitter handle uh it, it put out some material of course it made a very obvious kind of mistake which it corrected later in terms of the uh year of uh, birth of uh, swami vivekananda and all of that but essentially why i don't want to go into that those are that is low lying fruit low hanging fruit i want to go to uh, the essence of what it was saying and it was saying that um in the azadi ka amrit mahotsav that means the official sort of government sponsored celebrations of india's freedom um it referred to the uh phases of servitude that india has undergone prior to british rule and implied that a figure like chaitanya mahaprabhu a uh, hindu um uh, a, a a figure of hindu hindu um, uh, devote uh, devotion and all of that that chaitanya mahaprabhu was one of the freedom fighters against that kind of certitude and that is not the first time that is uh, you know that is now appearing of course in the official literature but uh, i should remind you that when uh, narendra modi the prime minister went to visit kedarnath uh, about a month and a half ago he again said there i request my countrymen that besides going to see the historical sites related to the freedom struggle go also to the sacred places in large numbers it is no mean service that they kept our faith together and didn't allow anybody to hurt it during the period of slavery isn't it the duty of every hindustani citizen to worship those who were doing great sadhana during the period of slavery repeated references to the period of slavery what is the period of slavery what is the period of uh, enslavement and uh, lack of freedom and freedom clearly uh, british raj company raj but uh, you know uh, in under the guise of acknowledging 75 years of india's freedom from british rule what narendra modi and the modi regime and the bjp is trying to do is to create a common sense that essentially freedom means uh, freedom from the very existence of muslims in the subcontinent and uh, of course we know that somebody like kangana ranaut she actually uh, spelt it out when she said that what india achieved in 2014 was just uh, arms it was just uh, charity and what uh, in india truly became free in 2014 when uh, what india achieved in 1947 was just arms just charity and what uh, and that india really became free in 2014 when basically a uh, hindu uh, rule in the shape of modi rule became a reality so um, 
that is basically the kind of common sense that there is an attempt to create right now. I don't, uh, I won't say that it is already uh, entirely successful, but I would say that given the situation right now, given the fact that your official schooling systems and college systems and so on are closed largely because of the pandemic, the fact that uh, you have a whole social media machinery that pushes uh, the, you know, the creates, you know, uh, knowledge to be consumed. And uh, over there, uh, the far right rules supreme. I think that it is a very real situation uh, of challenge for us. So um, how do we fight back? And uh, again, I think that uh, without, you know, without uh, much ado, I think that I'm addressing right now primarily people who recognize this, uh, recognize the need to fight back and recognize that this is, uh, these are fascists and that we are fighting back uh, the turning of the Indian state into a completely fascist machine. I think I do not need to uh, say here, but I'll say it anyway, that I disagree fundamentally with those who would declare that in 1947 itself, uh, India was basically a Hindu nation and that it has been that ever since and uh, all of that. There are I, The fact that I need to say this would appear ridiculous, but unfortunately it is true that there are those who uh, consider this to be, uh, you know, the, who, who articulate it in this way. Um, and they articulate it in this way in the name of, uh, um, and the assertion of uh, uh, oppressed minorities and so on. But essentially, I think it is uh, some, it is a way, it is a discourse that confirms and mirrors and confirms the Sangparivar discourse. And so it is a discourse that must be fought tooth and nail and uh, cannot be rehabilitated and cannot be accommodated. Um, the other thing is that. Uh, in terms of uh, the other thing that probably needs to be said again. Uh, globally, I noticed that there is a small strand of left thinking or whatever, which is basically some kind of uh, non-political kind of thinking, I would call it that, um, which goes around saying that uh, any kind of participation in elections is basically wrong and that uh, the left basically sh should uh, confine itself to uh, organizing people's movements and so on, and that the attempt to intervene in elections, for instance, to ensure that uh, Donald Trump loses, for instance, all these things are basically some kind of capitulation on part of the left and uh, so on and so forth. Again, I would like to say at the outset, I shouldn't even have to say it, but any kind of left thinking of this kind, I would say is completely bankrupt. And uh, I don't think it deserves uh, even to be, uh, uh, it doesn't deserve, I think, even basic respect, this kind of position, because essentially you're talking about people, uh, organizing people, uh, people whose uh, existence is uh, threatened by the, uh, by the continuation of fascists in power. And if you, are, if you can, uh, you know, say this kind of uh, childish kind of things equating fascists with the non-fascist forces and cannot see the difference, then frankly, I mean, uh, you know, what is the point of uh, uh, claiming uh, this kind of left moral superior ground and all of that, and you do not have, you know, even basic political common sense. Um, the third thing I think is a much more common in India and much more uh, to uh, a, a much more a reality to be confronted which is the idea that, of course, uh, electorally, we need um, alliances to fight the fascists. Fair enough. I would completely endorse that. But uh, what would these alliances be doing? I think there is a huge difference based, uh, about that. Because I think the basic idea is that these alliances are primarily uh, alliances between political parties, opposition parties, that they will these alliances will happen during election time. And that these, and that there is a tacit understanding that we will not be naming the elephant in the room. That these mainstream parties have, in a sense, conceded most of them, and I would say that almost all of them, uh, opposition parties, as in, appear to have conceded that uh, Hindus are basically uh, going to be offended 
if you say clearly that the establishment of a hindu rashtra is a dangerous proposition is it is is it is an active ongoing disaster an active ongoing um, danger and that naming islamophobia that elephant in the room is something which is taboo that you will you cannot get hindus to vote for you if you name islamophobia this appears to be the understanding of most uh, election uh, uh, most opposition parties that contest elections and uh, i think that the acceptance of this the manner in you know the very fact that they have conceded this uh, in a way they have uh, given up the battle against the fasc against fascism because essentially if you're going to concede that and if you're going to think then that in order to get uh, people to vote for you primarily people of uh, the majority community to vote for you you are going to have to uh, get them to vote for you on other grounds on the grounds of employment livelihood uh, labor laws farm laws and so on and so forth but that you cannot get them to uh, you, you need to get them to be thinking of those things while casting their vote if they are at all thinking about uh, hindutva Uh, then you cannot get them to oppose hindutva you cannot get them to vote against hindutva so this attempt this appears to be a largely accepted position this in fact is a huge normal whether it's a new normal or not this is a very dangerous kind of normal because uh, i don't see how the battle can be fought that way and even if elect election oriented parties are thinking that way how can people's movements uh, think in this manner um i think that uh, if we look at the recent thing which the government wanted to change and failed to change the farm laws which the government wanted to establish as the new corporate normal in terms of agriculture and completely failed to do so had to withdraw after one year of continuously trying all the tricks in the book and then failing to break that farmers movement and it was a farmers movement which uh, eventually did uh, openly in muzaffarnagar which was the ground of the terrible communal riots which helped uh, to bring the prime minister modi to power in 2013 14 um in that muzaffarnagar in a rally there uh, the farm movement actually explicitly uh, acknowledged islamophobia to be a danger and said that we uh, cannot afford to divide ourselves based on uh, these identities and all of that so the farmers movement did name the elephant in the room uh, they did have to do that they had to name the attempt to demonize sikhs and uh, as well as muslims and they had to fight back <clears throat> against this at least till uh, to an extent they did this and they won this remarkable victory so i think that uh, any assumption that we cannot name this and i see this assumption basically sir so, so. hello can you can you can you mute others please uh, just so that there isn't a disturbance while i'm speaking yeah thanks um yeah so basically i think that uh, if we are if we are um if we begin to accept this kind of notion that this silencing of uh, us that that it is all right for us to speak up on labor laws on livelihood on Uh, so many things but not on um, on 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 economic suffering but that there is a tacit silence that we must maintain on islamophobia then i think that we are uh, basically uh, committing uh, harakiri over here i think that um, but on the other hand i also think that the opposite of this which is to assume that all hindus are essentially uh, you know if you're identifying as hindu then you are Ident, you know, there's no distinction between your identifying as a Hindu and your identifying with uh, Hindutva as a political project and with uh, the establishment of Hindu nation as a political project. Uh, I think that that assumption, again, a mirror assumption in a sense uh, uh, of that, and the assumption, therefore, that any attempt to mobilize Hindus, any attempt to mobilize, uh, you know, to 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 reach out to Hindus. Uh, in this anti fascist project that is the absolutely a gone cause and that you have to assume that all hindus are uh, you know essentially a gone uh, a lost cause they are all irretrievably you know manuvadi and uh, islamophobic and so on and so forth 
i think that that also is a uh, project that is setting itself up for uh, uh, defeat because it is not uh, recognizing that you see we uh, um, let me put it this way that i think that the challenge before us now is that we have to help to organize those sections which are affected by the sang parivar the bjp policy offensive uh, economic policies education health and all of that which is being unleashed by the fascists in service of tony capitalist corporate funders and we have to take up this challenge with a whole lot of empathy that we have to command we have to take it up with all the uh, empathy uh, at our uh, and you can you have to you have to go and address this section that is uh, bearing the brunt of this offensive even while knowing that in amongst this section maybe the bulk of this section maybe the poorest of these sections the ones who have lost jobs the ones who have lost lives and loved ones to the covid-19 pandemic uh, and the uh, criminal handling of it by the modi regime those who have lost labor laws those who are uh, you know suffering uh, such a tremendous attack on agriculture that they too are uh, you know they are victimized by fascist politics even as they may be uh, ex you know they may they may be sharing several of the prejudices and assumptions uh, which uh, fascist politics has uh, has 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 basically spread so they are also victims of this they may be from the majority community uh, and and but we it is crucial for us to basically um you know if we are mobilizing them as workers as farmers and as dalits as uh, in in whatever way as women and so on we also have to take on the challenge of confronting that uh, you know uh, uh, hindu supremacist ideas manuvadi patriarchal ideologies that have made deep roots in these sections of people if you are not doing that work if you are saying that oh i am above all this why is it my job to basically uh, talk to people who are affected by these policies to work among dalits among adivasis among the poor among working class situated people who may hold some of these uh, some of some of the assumptions in bits and pieces of this hateful ideologies um, you know then you are basically uh, not doing what needs to be done and i think that working amongst them uh, freeing them from the thrall of fascist politics that is something which is the primary job that we have to do and we can only do it by confronting these hateful ideologies on our own terms we have to initiate the discussions on what it what a hindu rashtra means what um, what uh, uh, you know so called lab jihad means and so on and so forth all these things have to be confronted by us we have to initiate the conversations on our own terms and then uh, discuss them and, and we have to approach people from the from a sense of great empathy and sympathy with their situations and their the pain that they undergo uh, not as a tactical measure not just as some back door entry to uh, to you know come to what we want to talk about but to actually uh, work for their well being and uh, mobilize them for their own well being at the same time while uh, Uh, you know encouraging uh, them to have these uh, difficult conversations and um, basically uh, ensuring solidarity and sympathy um, in them for those who are oppressed based on faith based on faith faith identities uh think about how we are situated now where even another minority like the christian minority in india that the christian minority which itself is under attack such a, a, you know open attack by the sang parivar uh, christians are being attacked every now and then and yet the christian leadership is able to be so easily islamophobic right uh the fact that you can uh, you know or i think these are things which we realities which we need to confront that you have a situation where those who are oppressed themselves uh, do not necessarily have sympathy and solidarity automatically with others who are oppressed and building that solidarity building that comradeship among the various sections of the oppressed i think that that is absolutely crucial as i like to quote uh, bertolt brecht on this issue uh, the way he put it was that the compassion of the oppressed for the oppressed is indispensable it is the world's one hope and i think that working for that that is the crucial issue for us here and uh, uh, finally politically i would like to say that how should the left view itself 
I think that the left needs to view itself as an invaluable component of an anti-fascist coalition, a political coalition. The left cannot view itself just as a lobby, as a you know political pressure group. Uh, basically, uh, the left's uh, USP has to be that we must address issues of justice uh, forefront. And when I say left, obviously, uh, I do mean that um, uh, I do not mean those models of governance which basically, uh, you know, help to normalize something like the UAPA, help to normalize fake encounters, uh, help to normalize uh, Islamophobic uh, dog whistles or anything like that. I do not accept that. I think that we need to fight back against that. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, essentially, uh, I, I, certainly I'm not talking about uh, the disastrous uh, method in which we, uh, in the name of being left, we go around equating non-BJP parties as uh, pa as fascists along with BJP parties and all of, along with the BJP and so on. <clears throat> but I think that the left's USP has to be that we cannot be defensively ignoring issues of justice. Uh, we have to uh, absolutely put issues of justice center stage as equivalent with uh, bread and butter issues. We have to remember again, Bertolt Brecht talking about the bread of justice uh, in Saaf Ki Ruti, the bread of justice and how that bread of justice has to be baked every day and we have to uh, we have to uh, that that has to be our um, uh, um, that has to be you know the building the confidence that we must have we have to have that this is an essential survival policy we must have the vocabulary and the skill to persuade uh, people our own potential uh, uh, you know in our in the, in the ranks of people's movements as well as beyond that to persuade even Hindus in those ranks to recognize and oppose injustice against Muslims. It's very simple, but we have to, if we cannot even do that, if we do not have the confidence to go ahead and put that center stage, then I, I, uh, I think that would be uh, very uh, self-destructive. And uh, I believe that we can do it. I believe in my own party's experience in elections uh, is proof that that can be done that you can respond to the migrant crisis and to issues of lockdown and unemployment, that you can respond to workers and peasants issues that you can, uh, and at the same time that you can address, address issues arising from CA and PRNRC, communal lynchings, uh, politically motivated arrests and uh, abrogation of Article 370 and uh, oppression on Kashmir that we can uh, take the names of Umar Khalid and Sharjil Imam and Ishrat Jaha and Gulfisha and Safura and all of that uh, without, and Sudha Bharadwaj and Gautam Nolakha without uh, any kind of, uh, um, without any shyness and without any hesitation, uh, that we can uh, you know, openly call out Yogi Adityanath who, who's talking about turning elections into 80% versus 20% calling that out, talking about what is this 20%, what is this 80%, and we are we are challenging you on that issue uh, on Islamophobic uh, talk. Uh, I think that it is quite possible to win elections even with this strategy, to defeat BJP even with this strategy. That we have to be bold in uh, believing that it is possible to change the ground even now. Uh, even in this change situation, to use BJP's own arrogance and strength to uh, ag against it in a way, you know, like like in a wrestling match, the way in which a wrestler would use the strength of an opponent in order to uh, topple them. That is what we need to do. We need, and we can do that only by having uh, immense confidence in people, immense confidence that people of this country are not lost, that they are not a lost cause that they are not a lost cause and that we are not a lost cause. And I believe that it is possible to do that. I'll end by saying something which I like to say to everyone, which is that I think that uh, these are hard times for us also, uh, those of us who are activists, who are justice loving. It's a very, very hard time. We are often struggling with health issues of our own and uh, mental health also is a difficult situation for many, many on, at such a time. In such circumstances, I would say that uh, cultivating uh, you know, it's like it's like training for a marathon. It's like training for a long distance run that you have to exercise every day. And so I think that exercising the uh, muscle of hope every day 
uh, getting up in the morning and figuring out how to exercise that hope muscle every day uh, is important. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically, it, you, have, you cannot assume that everybody is going to be in that uh, fit and fighting shape at all times. You have to actually work for it. And I think it's possible for us to do that. Thank you.